its claims to the law. So um, we had an overwhelming response to the event today and we've got a lot of people online have lost count um, I can't look at that at the minute um, but welcome to all our Zoom participants as well. Um, so Allied Health and PBS are currently recruiting to expand to um, keep up with their support services and um, we've got great managers on a culture of developing and learning which is why we're providing this free professional development event today and we hope you all enjoy it I know you will. Um, so to the main event I'll introduce Dr Erin Leaf who may be known to a lot of you as Erin is a globally recognized behavior analyst who is a board certified behavior analyst and a senior lecturer at Monash University. Erin is passionate about the science of human behavior, learning, language, and cognition. Erin's primary research interests have involved the exploration of strategies for building the capacity of the workforce, which is why we're joining in that, and to better support individuals with additional needs, especially children and young people um, who are most at risk of exclusion and social isolation. In this presentation today, Dr. Erin Leaf will discuss risk factors for trauma, the impact of trauma on learning and development, and ways to deliver evidence-based trauma-informed services that focus on building skills and resilience. And I'm sure you'll enjoy it. Let's welcome Dr. Erin. Hi, let me just get the notes here. Can you see me on the video? No. Okay. The video is good. All right. Got it. Oops. Do you know how I move the thing? Like, get the slide shot. Where's Julian? <laughs> we'll get started in one moment. Okay, while we're waiting. Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. How do I move the slides? Thank you so much for being here today. And thank you so much, Fiona and Harth for inviting me to have the opportunity to talk to you today. I'm just multitasking for a quick second here. Um, before we, oh, do I have to do it up there? Just tap, okay, just tap. Just tap. Okay. Just tap. <laughs> and as usual, I just throw my stuff all over the room. So we'll see if I can stay organized. Um, before we begin, I just would also like to acknowledge that the event today takes place on Warren Waterwurrung country and pay respects to Waterwurrung elders past, present and emerging and extend that respect to any First Nations people joining us here today in person or online. Um, and I also, also would like to acknowledge that Aboriginal um, sovereignty has not been ceded and recognize the impact of colonization on First Nations people and the past and ongoing trauma of colonization. So we have a couple of objectives for our session this morning. We're going to talk a little bit more about what trauma is and the impact of trauma. We'll identify the principles of trauma-informed care. So what does it mean to be trauma-informed? Because many of us here today are working specifically in positive behavior support, we'll talk a little bit more about how we can think about integrating the principles of trauma-informed practice into the functional behavior assessment process, as well as into the behavior support process. We'll talk about how we might integrate the principles of trauma-informed care into behavior support for individuals, but also within organizational systems to promote healthy and resilient um, service provider organizations. So I'd like to start with a myth. I always start with a myth. And this is that positive behavior support is but one intervention for reducing challenging behavior. In fact, instead of an intervention, I would like to encourage you to think about positive behavior support as a framework. Within that framework, we might be able to deliver a whole range of evidence-informed strategies to support people. 
And when delivering positive behavior support, our main goal is ultimately to build skills and improve quality of life for the person. We call this an, a constructional approach. We're interested in building skills. And when we can build skills and move people, people closer to the things that bring them joy in life, we should see reductions in behaviors of concern as a side effect rather than as the main goal of the support that we provide. So there are some important underpinning principles of positive behavior support. So some of, an, I guess, an understanding of these principles can help us recognize how positive behavior support is in fact a framework rather than a single type of intervention. So the first principle is that positive behavior support is values led. In other words, our goal as practitioners is to select, individualize, implement, and evaluate a wide variety of strategies for the person. And those strategies should ultimately help the person participate in their community, experience more choice and control within their own lives, learn new functional skills, and build meaningful relationships with others, and enhance social inclusion. And we do all, these, all of these things rather than focusing on behavioral reduction in isolation. Positive behavior support is also underpinned by the assumption that challenging behavior serves a purpose for the individual. And that the very best way that we can help people with their behaviors of concern is by understanding the reason why these challenges are happening. And through the process of functional behavior assessment, we can understand the purpose of a behavior for a person. And then we can deliver behavior support strategies that focus on teaching the person new ways to communicate that are safer and more understandable and new ways to have their wants and needs met. We do this rather than simply trying to reduce behaviors of concern. And we do this by taking steps to teach the person forms of communication. With positive behavior support, we put a big focus on the environment. So we want to understand the interaction between behavior and the environment. We want to look at ways in which the environment is actually contributing to either behaviors of concern or the person's ability to demonstrate new skills and participate in meaningful life activities. So if a person is engaging in behaviors of concern when they're asked to complete a task that is too difficult, non-preferred, um, aversive, then we look at changing the task. How can we break that task down into smaller teachable components? How can we set the person up for success through the learning process so that learning and engagement is fun, easy, and rewarding? And then we can start to scaffold um, the difficulty level of the task. So again, positive behavior support often uses skill teaching as a core component of behavior support because lagging skills often directly contribute to the occurrence of behaviors of concern. If the person doesn't have a skill, then they don't have a choice. And if a person doesn't have a skill, then perhaps engaging in behaviors of concern is the very, very best that they can do under the circumstances. So when we're able to uh, teach new skills, create better and more enriched environments for people to live in and discover what brings people joy and meaning in life and create those joyful contacts, we're able to re achieve reductions in behaviors of concern as a side effect or byproduct. Doing all of these things can help us move our clients towards experiencing a better quality of life. But it's important to remember that what is defined as a good quality of life is not defined by you as a practitioner. It's defined by the individual. Everybody is different and what has value and brings people joy is going to be very different from person to person. So I would say that person-centered planning, which we'll talk about a little bit more, is a really critical component of the delivery of positive behavior support services. It helps the team around the person identify what brings people joy and take steps to move closer to those experiences.
And another important principle of positive behavior support, which I think is quite difficult to fully realize in the NDIS context, is that it's a long-term approach. Sometimes we're supporting people who have really long and complex learning histories and, and personal experience histories, and challenging behavior is really, really entrenched. And it takes a long time to change behavior, and it takes a long time to create new contexts around the person. And so it's really critical as part of the provision of services that we provide that we're able to establish more longer-term relationships with our clients and be able not only to write a behavior support plan, but actually coach others in, in implementation of that support plan and evaluate the outcomes for the client. We need to be really responsive. If our clients are not um, demonstrating a good outcome, that's meaningful to them, we need to be able to change the intervention and change the approach. And so I think part of what we need to do as positive behavior support practitioners is continue to advocate to funding bodies about the need for funding that's going to allow for that ongoing relationship with the client and that ongoing support. And I think that's a challenge that many people are currently facing. So with this in mind, we can look at the NDIS's definition of positive behavior support, keeping in mind that I argue that positive behavior support is a framework, not an intervention. And so the PBS capability framework defines positive behavior support as the term used to describe the integration of the contemporary ideology of disability service provision, so values, person-centered, strengths-based, with the clinical framework of applied behavior analysis or decision-making, a database decision-making model. And positive behavior support strategies are supported by evidence and encompass a range of strategies and methods that aim to increase a person's quality of life and reduce challenging behavior. So what actually is trauma-informed PBS? Sometimes I get asked, should I be doing trauma-informed practice or should I be doing PBS? And I think that's the wrong question. It's not an either or. It's a both, it's an and question. The question is, how do I do trauma-informed PBS? How do I bring the principles and practices of trauma-informed care into the PBS framework so I can address the needs of the people that I support in a more holistic way? Recognizing that trauma or um, people's adverse life experiences can certainly contribute to the development and maintenance of behaviors of concern. So let's look a little bit more at what it actually means to be trauma informed. What is trauma? There's a lot of discussion about trauma these days. It's become a bit of a hot topic. And I think it's sort of um, the term sometimes is, is used really loosely and, and we kind of lose a little bit of what, of what the word trauma actually means. So in a very quick summary, trauma is a person's emotional response to a distressing situation. Few people will go through life without encountering some form of adversity. Adversity and hardship for all of us is normal. There's a continuum of adversity and many of us will face adverse events and be able to use our coping strategies and be successful in responding. Unlike ordinary hardships, traumatic events, hello, <laughs> that was mic drop what I just said. <laughs> traumatic events tend to be sudden and unpredictable and can involve a serious threat to somebody's personal safety. In fact, can be life-threatening and feel beyond the person's control. Most importantly, these events are traumatic to the degree that they undermine a person's sense of safety in the world and create a sense that catastrophe could strike at any time. So people who have experienced trauma view their world as very unsafe and very unpredictable. And imagine if that was you. Imagine all of the sense of anxiety and dread and hopelessness and helplessness that might come along with that. So there's a number of different types of trauma. Now trauma, a traumatic experience could happen to anybody at any point in time. 
So again, you may have acute trauma, which is generally a single event, something like a bushfire, an accident or a shooting. It's a single event where somebody's ability to cope and stay safe is significantly undermined. There's also something called chronic trauma. And chronic trauma can result from repeated and prolonged exposure to highly stressful events. So this can include things like child abuse and neglect, bullying or domestic violence. And complex trauma can result from a person experiencing multiple traumatic events over the course of their life. So trauma can mix and match in lots of different ways and affect people. We also can talk about secondary or vicarious trauma. This is a form of trauma that a person develops from having close contact with someone who has experienced tra a traumatic event. So family members, mental health professionals, PBS practitioners, and others who care for support individuals who have experienced trauma um, actually are, are at a higher risk of also experiencing secondary or vicarious trauma, which is why it's so important to take an organizational approach to trauma-informed practice because there's a need to support um, staff members, support workers, and practitioners who may be working very closely with people who have experienced trauma every day. So we've also heard PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder. So what's P PTSD? This is a reaction or a set of reactions to experiencing a traumatic event. PTSD can develop when the symptoms of trauma persist or get worse in the weeks or months or much later after the person has experienced the traumatic event. And PTSD is distressing and does really interfere with a person's daily life and relationships. So some symptoms might include severe anxiety or flashbacks, persistent memories of the event. Um, we also might see a lot of avoidance behavior. We start to escape and avoid um, things that remind us of the traumatic event. Um, we might try to avoid thinking about the traumatic event, which can result in other unhelpful, unproductive behaviors to try to numb um, feelings and emotions. Um, but not everyone who experiences a traumatic event will develop PTSD. This is one of the really difficult and tricky things about trauma is that it affects everyone differently. And so it's impossible to say what one person's reaction is going to be to experience experiencing a single traumatic event or multiple traumatic events within their life. But there are some risk factors for developing PTSD. And these include things like previous exposure to traumatic, uh, trauma or experiencing traumatic events, physical pain or physical injury as a result of the traumatic event, or having little support after the traumatic event. So one thing we'll revisit later on is the importance of support networks and building healthy support networks around a person who has experienced trauma. It's also difficult for people who are experiencing other insecurities to cope with trauma. So housing insecurity or job insecurity or food insecurity. So this already puts people who may be at a disadvantage at higher risk for developing PTSD in response to traumatic events. So these are really important social issues that need to be addressed as part of um, the wider, I guess, adoption of trauma informed practice. So one type of traumatic event that's been more extensively researched is called adverse childhood experiences or ACEs. And ACEs are potentially traumatic events that occur in childhood, so between birth and 17 years of age, um, and generally include experiencing violence, abuse or neglect, witnessing, witnessing family violence in the home, or having a family member who is either um, dealing with drugs and alcohol, has been incarcerated. Um, all of these things can fall into the category of adverse um, childhood experiences, um, and they're common. Um, a study in the United States showed that 61% of adults have been exposed to at least one ACEs, 
and ACE, and nearly one in six reported being exposed to four or more types of ACEs. So research generally says the higher the number of ACEs that someone has been exposed to, the more likely they're going to experience um, potentially um, I guess, symptoms of PTSD or uh, behaviors in response to trauma later in life. So again, learning how to cope with adversity is a normal part of childhood. The goal here isn't to eliminate adversity and hardship because these are natural parts of the human experience. But there are different, I guess, that's hard to see. That just shows that there are different degrees of stress. So the green represents healthy stress. This is stress that influences many of us on a regular basis. Um, scientists actually call this positive stress. So we can deal with things that happen in life that are, that are difficult, like the death of a loved one or um, a car accident. We, we often can deal with those things. Um, they're, they're difficult, but we can deal with them in healthy ways. Um, but as somebody experiences stressful events over and over again, or as somebody experiences, experiences a stressful event but has very little support around them, um, that stress can become toxic, which is when we move over to the red side of the equation. Um, and toxic stress can have really negative effects on the developing brain, on learning, and on um, memory relationships, all sorts of aspects of life. So when somebody is exposed to strong, frequent, or prolonged adverse experiences, such as extreme poverty or repeated abuse, um, and especially when those things are experienced without a strong support system, the stress can become toxic. And what happens is there's chemical reactions in the brain that can significantly significantly interrupt how the brain functions and develops. So we know that children who experience toxic stress can have difficulty forming healthy and stable relationships. And when we think about what it means to be human, having relationships with other people is, is really, really um, an important part of, of who we are. You know, we think about building independence with the individuals that we support, but actually maybe we should focus on interdependence, building healthy interdependence, because we all rely on other people in our lives. We're social beings. Um, so when children or, or anyone has difficulty forming positive relationships, that can be really disruptive. Um, they may have unstable work histories as adults and struggle financially, struggle with um, finances, jobs. They may experience anxiety and depression and face further exposure to toxic stress as a result of these other factors. So it's a bit of a, a vicious cycle that happens. And there's another type of trauma called intergenerational trauma. And this is defined as trauma that gets passed down through generations um, and generally um, can occur when people in, in earlier generations, grandparents or relatives experience trauma themselves. And this is something that's um, a little bit harder to understand some of the mechanisms by which this happens, but um, it may begin with a traumatic event it's, um, impacting a person or, or a group of people. Um, um, and then that can have sort of ripple on effects and affect larger communities or get passed down through generations. Um, and so it can be transmitted in a number of ways. It's really interesting to kind of read about some of the, the research in this area, but this, this idea of epigenetics or um, our genes um, are very pliable and they can actually be switched on or off in response to uh, specific environmental events. And, and they can control things like our stress responses and our release of stress chemicals in our brain. And so sometimes what happens is um, people, uh, younger children, um, their genes are sort of more, I guess, um, sensitive to environmental stressors and they might have a more significant reaction to stress. Stress might become more toxic um, in smaller doses. So there could be actually a genetic component to how intergenerational trauma transmits. But we also have to think about things like parenting practices. You know, as young children, we learn what we see. 
we learn a lot through modeling. And so if we're um, growing up in households where we're always witnessing um, unhealthy parenting practices or domestic violence or substance abuse, then we might be more likely to engage in those behaviors when we become adults. Um, in addition, parents who experience trauma may have a harder time forming emotional attachments with their children. And so as a result, children might have difficulty forming attachments in return with other adults, and um, that can be perpetuated over time. Um, so there are a number of ways that um, trauma can be transmitted intergener intergenerationally. Um, it can also be transmitted within communities through things like cultural traditions, um, as well as normalization of, of cruelty, um, it, uh, discrimination, aggression, um, and whatnot. So there's so many considerations. And again, this is what makes trauma tricky is because there's so many different events that can contribute. Um, it's really hard to be specific about um, what it will look like and how it will impact individuals. So I wanna talk about two things, trauma-specific services and trauma-informed practice. So trauma-specific services refers to evidence-based and promising prevention, intervention, or treatment services that address traumatic stress. So these are interventions that directly address a person's trauma. And some examples of trauma-specific interventions include things like trauma-focused cognitive behavioral therapy, child parent psychotherapy, the Seeking Safety Program, cognitive processing therapy, or eye movement desensitization and repro reprocessing therapy. These are practices that are used by um, qualified professionals working within their scope of practice and competence. So you might use a practice like this if you're a licensed or a clinical psychologist or a social worker or a mental health professional. Um, it's important to note that these need to be um, used by people that are well skilled in addressing trauma. Um, and they often require um, a certain um, qualification or supervised training experiences. So I'm not going to be talking today about how to use trauma-specific services. Rather, I'm going to be talking about trauma-informed practice, because I think this is something we can all draw on. So this is a strengths-based service delivery approach that is grounded in an understanding of and responsiveness to the impact of trauma. And it emphasizes physical, psychological, and emotional safety for both providers and individuals. It creates opportunities for people who have experienced trauma to rebuild a sense of control and empowerment within their own lives. And it also involves vigilance in anticipating and avoiding institutional processes or practices that are likely to re-traumatize individuals who have experienced traumatic events. So it's an approach that takes steps to understand what trauma is and how it, it can impact people and take steps to build safety around people and avoid exposing people to re-traumatizing events within the provision of care. So we can think about trauma-informed practice as being underpinned by the four R's. So the first R is realize. So we want to realize the impact of trauma. We want to realize the likelihood of risk factors and the likelihood that someone that we're supporting may have experienced risk factors for trauma at some point within their life. We also want to be able to recognize the signs of trauma. And these signs might vary depending on someone's age, gender, or the specific setting in which you're working with them. And they may manifest in many, many different ways for a person. But throughout all aspects of service delivery, we're aware 
and looking to recognize whether the behaviors that we're seeing from the individuals we support might have a component linked to trauma. We also strive to respond in healthy ways when supporting people who have been impacted by trauma. And so this involves responding through the provision of individualized behavior support strategies that are trauma informed, but also building an organizational system that is trauma informed and, and noting within organizational policies and procedures, how staff will receive training in the principles of trauma-informed practice and how staff will be supported to screen for trauma and learn how to be more trauma-aware and trauma-responsive in the design and development of behavior support strategies. And finally, we have resist. So we want to resist re-traumatization re-trauma and in order to resist, we need to understand, we need to respond we need to recognize and, and be aware of how trauma can affect people and, and the types of trauma that our clients have encountered. So we also need to resist re-traumatization for our staff. So we often inadvertently, or we as organizations can sometimes inadvertently create stressful environments that actually interfere with the recovery of clients who have experienced trauma, the well-being of staff, and fulfillment of an organizational mission. Um, and so we have to just think about um, is what we're doing in the best interest of the client and how are we um, being mindful of those previously, previous traumatic experiences that they may have encountered. So we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay, and so trauma-informed practice is also underpinned by six guiding principles. And so again, what we want to do when we're delivering positive behavior support services is think about how we can integrate these principles into all aspects of how we work. So the first is safety. We should strive to create environments and services that establish safe physical and emotional environments where the person's basic needs are met and safety measures are in place. Not ready to move on yet. We also abide by the principle of trustworthiness and transparency. So what this means is that how we work within our organization and how our operations work and how decisions are made are conducted with transparency with the goal of building and maintaining trust with our clients, family members, and among staff and leaders within the organization. The next is peer support. This is really important. We don't want to be the only person that our client can depend on. Rather, we want to um, help our clients establish safe, authentic, and positive relationships with a wide range of people who they might be um, engaging with within their local communities. The next is collaboration and mutuality. mutuality. That's a weird word. So with this, we want to share power, right? Often people who have experienced trauma have had very, very little power. They've had, they've been in relationships or situations where somebody else has held a lot of power in that relationship. And so through the delivery of trauma-informed practices and supports, we want to equalize power dynamics in, in the relationship. We want to work with a client rather than do to a client. And so within this, we want to include the voices of the people that we support in the decision-making process. We also might include our clients in the, in the process of reviewing and, and modifying or you know, um, updating our institutional policies and procedures to make sure that the way that we operate is in line with you know, the general values and needs of our client population. The next is empowerment, voice, and choice. So we really want to strive to help our clients regain a sense of control over their own lives. Again, people who have experienced trauma has, have often experienced very little control or the complete elimination of control over their own lives. 
And we want to do this through, we can do this in lots of different ways, but we want to do this by um, providing choices, building somebody's capability to make informed choices, using things like the supported decision-making framework. Um, we also want to keep our clients informed, again, about how services are going to be delivered within our organization that permits them um, to have all the information about the services they're receiving and to make choices about service provision. And finally, we need to maintain a sense of cultural responsiveness. And this is really important because people who have experienced trauma um, often come from marginalized, historically marginalized cultural groups. And so we need to maintain a really holistic view of the people that we support and recognize the intersectionality of um, somebody's adverse life experiences, their um, ethnicity, um, where they live, what socioeconomic status they're from. Um, and we wanna look at helping people reconnect with their lo local cultural communities, like helping people connect with the cultural traditions um, of, of their community um, and you know, work on building emotional, physical, relational, and spiritual health through connection with local community. And within our organization, we wanna seek to break down stereotypes, biases, or other things that can influence delivering services that really reflect my lens and my point of view to delivering services that truly reflect the client's point of view about what's important in life and what they want to achieve. There are a couple of barriers to discussing Oh, I missed a page. I'm just so trauma-informed positive behavior support is an approach to delivering positive behavior support that strives to integrate the principles of trauma-informed practice and the four R's into how we deliver positive behavior support services and how we function as an organization to support all of our staff to be trauma-informed, healthy, and resilient in the work that they do. But there are a couple of barriers to understanding and integrating trauma-informed practice into our work as PBS practitioners. The first is that PBS practitioners, we tend to like to focus on observable things, right? Like we wanna be able to like take data on how often a behavior occurs or um, understand like what happened in the environment right before a behavior and what happened right after a behavior. Um, but trauma is often, we're often using emotional terms. We're often talking about things like stress and resilience which can be harder to measure. And so that can pose a challenge sometimes for, for behavioral practitioners. Um, we also tend to focus on the environment when we're doing assessments. And so let's think about a classic um, type of data collection during functional behavior assessment. We tend to focus on the antecedents, behaviors, and consequences. So think about your ABC um, data collection or your star charts. You're thinking about what happened right before the behavior, what did the behavior look like, and what happened right after. That's a very micro or zoomed in view of behavior in the moment. That may not tell us a whole heck of a lot about those traumatic events that have happened in someone's history that are actually also influencing their behavior here today. So some of our methods of assessment make it difficult to really understand the impact of trauma. And finally, um, although there are frameworks for integrating trauma-informed practice into what we do, I can't really point to a lot of peer reviewed literature that actually says that this is going to result in better outcomes, but I don't know that that matters because I think it's just a safer and more person centered way of delivering services. But again, these are some of the challenges that can um, come up when we're trying to be trauma informed in our work as PBS practitioners. Let's talk about what learning processes are involved. So how does trauma happen? Um, we'll talk about this from a bit of a behavioral science perspective. So the first thing we can think about is the role of reflexes. Um, so what actually happens when somebody is exposed to a traumatic event? Actually get out my slide so I can see. So first what happens is a person is in a situation 
where they're exposed to a real or perceived threatening situation in which their ability to cope is dramatically reduced. And this causes an activation in the brain. This isn't learned behavior. This is your neurobiology taking over. And parts of your brain associated with fight or flight. There's a release of chemicals in the brain that signal danger. Again, this is neurobiology. There's also physiological changes, such as an increase in heart rate or rapid respiration, right? You're ready to fight or you're ready to flight or freeze or please. And then your reflexes kick in. What do you do? Do you run or do you freeze or do you disassociate? It depends, but there's a whole lot of neurobiology happening. And we can look at this from the lens of what we call respondent conditioning in behavior science, but we also, again, might call it just neurobiology of trauma. After the traumatic experience ends, what has happened is that the environment around us when we experienced that traumatic event has now been paired with that experience, with that adverse experience. So the environment around us then becomes thing, it becomes it's things like the location where the traumatic event occurred, the people who are around us when the traumatic event occurred, and the activities we were doing when the traumatic event occurred. All these things become paired with that physiological experience when the traumatic event happened. And then again, when we're in a situation where we're in that environment or we're with those people or we're doing that activity, even if that traumatic event isn't happening anymore, we still might experience those physiological sensations. We still might experience a release of stress hormones or we might experience um, a change in our physiology, like increased heart rate and respiration. So what's happened is relatively every day, things that we come into contact with are now triggers. They're now triggering those same physiological reactions. So now we can look at the brain. How is this impacting the brain? Gets real interesting. So when we're looking at the impact of trauma, we generally can look at how it impacts three different parts of the brain, the hippocampus, the amygdala, and the prefrontal cortex. So, Again, it's important to note that traumatic events are not unique because they're rare. It's because they overwhelm our normal coping response. Our normal coping responses allow our brain to work optimally, to think, to problem solve, to make decisions, and to maintain a sense of control, connection, meaning, and safety. The amygdala down in the brainstem is a real um, core survival mechanism of the brain. And this is where we perceive danger. And this is where our automatic sort of reflexes kick in and we come up with these, or we, we don't do anything. Our body automatically will fight or flight in the face of danger. Then what happens is our hippocampus also is impacted by the stress hormones that are released because of the signals in the amygdala. And the, the hippocampus is a part of the brain that's really tied to learning and memory. And the release, the, the ongoing release of stress chemicals can actually damage parts of the hippocampus, which can make it difficult for individuals who have experienced trauma to remember and to learn new things. And finally, the prefrontal cortex is a part of our brain that's involved in executive functioning, decision-making, planning. And research shows that the ongoing release of stress chemicals can also damage the, hippocamp um, the prefrontal cortex which can negatively impact somebody's ability to engage in all those executive functioning behaviors. So now what happens is we can shift from understanding the neurobiology and we can look at learning. We call this in behavior science operant conditioning, or it's the degree to which we learn new things within our lifetime through exposure to learning opportunities and, and consequences. Um, and so what happens when we're in situations where we've experienced traumatic events and we've experienced um, these sort of autonomic fight or flight reactions and that pairing of environmental stimuli 
um, happens with the trauma event is that we learn that we can engage in specific behaviors. And those specific behaviors can help release or reduce the impact of the physiological sensations and help us avoid um, experiencing the things that are now associated with trauma. So what happens is that certain behaviors help us learn to avoid triggering stimuli. They help us learn to escape triggering stimuli when we actually experience them. These behaviors can help us reduce specific uncomfortable thoughts and feelings. And these behaviors can help somebody learn to communicate their wants and needs. So what's happened is some behaviors has, have developed in direct response to experiencing the traumatic event. But now these behaviors maintain because they serve a purpose for the individual. And that's really good for us as PBS, it's not good for anyone, but it's good for us as PBS practitioners because it's so aligned to this idea of functional thinking or identifying the reason why behaviors are happening. How do behaviors of concern serve the person? How do they help the person get their needs met? So let's take a look at a couple of risk factors. We're going to go through these quickly because we've pretty much already talked about them, but there are a lot of risk factors for trauma. Some of them relate to things like family violence, alcoholism, poverty, unemployment, and financial hardship. Now, disability is a risk factor. So Think about why somebody with a disability, particularly someone with um, substantially higher support needs who has trouble with communicating might experience um, complex trauma. Think about how difficult your life would be if day in and day out, you couldn't even really communicate your basic wants and needs. Think about what a stressful experience that would be every day. And now think about a context where you have new people constantly coming in and out of your life that don't know you very well. And you're now not living with family members, but you're living in supported accommodation. You maybe don't know the people that you're living with. And maybe you're very socially isolated. As a result of your challenging behavior, you no longer can go out in the community you no longer have friends and family come over. Like, think about how that is the reality for a lot of the clients that engage in, in behaviors of concern that we support. And many of those things tick the boxes as risk factors for trauma. So we don't actually have really good data on the prevalence of trauma for people with disability, but we estimate that it's probably pretty high. We've talked about this already, but trauma can have lots of effects on the developing brain. And we might see both an increase in certain behaviors and a decrease in certain behaviors. I think it's also worth noting that we might see, in addition to our initial fight, flight, or freeze types of responses, in some cases, we might see a please response or some people's response to trauma might be an excessive, uh, excessive compliance or an excessive um, desire to please people, particularly people in a position of power. And that can be really maladaptive, right? Because that might get them into dangerous situations, make them vulnerable um, and put them at risk for being taken advantage of. Um, but a lot of the types of behavior that we see in response to experiencing traumatic events present like behaviors of concern, irritability, inattentiveness, um, you know, uh, escape and avoidance, not wanting to participate in activities, um, difficulties with emotional regulation, difficulty learning new skills. So again, we often see um, impairments in behavior control. And this isn't to say that every uh, difficulty with behaviors is because of trauma. It's just to say that behaviors of concern 
are a common response. So we need to be vigilant when we're looking into somebody's history to discover the type of um, unique life experiences that may have contributed to where this person is today. A few things that I like to point out, particularly with people who have been in environments where they have experienced adverse experiences or trauma, is that sometimes behaviors of concern are in fact a very adaptive response to a very maladaptive environment. For people who are experiencing adversity, sometimes behaviors that look very concerning are the best that they can do in those circumstances. So one of the things we keep in mind when supporting people who have been impacted by trauma is unconditional positive regard, or this idea that they're not inherently bad people, they've experienced some pretty crappy circumstances and we can help. They can start to re-engage in the world around them in ways that are going to serve them better. I also like to say that, remember, everybody's response to a potentially traumatic event is different. So that makes trauma-informed practice a bit challenging <laughs> because there's so many risk factors and there's so many potential presentations. It's not about, for us and the work that we do, it's not about diagnosing whether someone has PTSD. We can do this work without being diagnostic. Rather, it's understanding. And it's understanding that two behaviors that might look very different may both be responses to trauma or two behaviors that look identical serve very different functions for different people. So how can we support people who have experienced trauma? The first thing is just to understand understand the range of risk factors and understand just how many um, types of events can, can be difficult for a person to cope with. It's also to, important to understand that people who have experienced trauma view their world as an unpredictable and threatening place. So one of the very best things that we can do is to help people experience a sense of predictability within their lives. By understanding trauma, we can perhaps move towards using a person-centered approach where we're trying to work with the person as partners with the person or with their, their sort of inner circle of support, their, care, their carers, their parents as partners in the behavior support process, not as us coming in as experts. And we wanna develop programs that promote protective factors. So we've talked about risk factors, the great thing is, is that we also have protective factors, which we'll look at in a few minutes. Our program should ultimately bring in a lot of ways to build those protective factors around a person. So we need to care about being trauma-informed in the work that we do because we often support people who probably have experienced more risk. There's a high prevalence of ACEs among children, and many of you probably support children. There's a high, we think, prevalence of trauma in people with intellectual and developmental disabilities as a function of how their lives um, are day to day with perhaps limited communication and social, social isolation. And in particular, there's a higher prevalence in people with communication delays and difficulties. So this probably um, sounds like clients that you, you support within your work. We often support people who may not be able to tell us about their ACEs. They may not be able to tell us about whether they've experienced trauma. And the trauma history may remain unknown. And I would say that's okay because we're just thinking from a trauma-informed perspective in all of the work that we do. So I really like this quote from my colleague who wrote a paper on trauma-informed practice. And he says that in the absence of concrete knowledge about a person's history of trauma, it may be best to assume 
that any client walking through the door to services could have a history of trauma and to behave accordingly by exercising caution with respect to clinical decision making and vigilance with respect to observing avoidance or negative emotional behavior. So how can we support people in ways where we're creating contexts around them where they're happy, relaxed, and engaged as a first priority? And by doing this, by focusing on the environment, by focusing on building relation, relationships, we can set the stage for safe service delivery that may minimize the likelihood of re-traumatizing a person. So trauma-informed practice shifts the question from what is wrong with you to what has happened to you. It's understanding that every person has a unique learning history. And this can impact our behavior here today in lots and lots of different ways. The other nice thing about this approach, by asking a person what's happened to you, is that I think it's really consistent with a function-based approach to thinking about challenging behavior. Help me understand what's happened within your life that has impacted you. And we actually have a lot of tools to potentially do this for people that can't readily tell us. So trauma is commonly assessed using some standardized screening tools. Now I'm not gonna go through these in detail, but what it's important to note about some of these common screening tools like the, which you can't probably see, the ACEs screening tool, it just asks a series of, of questions like, have you ever, um, were your parents divorced or did you experience this or you know, alcoholism in the home or whatever? And you basically go through with someone and you just score yes or no. And then you add up the number of questions that were scored with a yes and you get kind of an ACEs score. The higher number of ACEs, the higher probability that somebody may be experiencing um, some sort of um, stress or post-traumatic stress later in life. There's another one. Again, it's typically just to tick a box. What's the likelihood that this happened to you or identifying whether specific risk factors are present in somebody's history, but these may not be so useful. First of all, again, we're not in the business of diagnosing trauma. That's not our job. We're not diagno diagnosticians. Um, it also may be contraindicated or not advisable to directly ask people about their experiences of trauma because doing so, asking people to tell you about their trauma could actually re-traumatize them. That could actually be an unadvisable strategy. So I actually don't advocate for using those more traditional types of trauma screening tools within our process. But we can think a little bit differently about how we might integrate the four R's into the functional behavior assessment process. So here we have two pictures. I'll read them to you. On one side, we have the picture of Mulan. So Mulan runs away from home to join the army in place of her ailing father to bring honor to her family. And then in the other picture, we have Rapunzel. Rapunzel runs away from home to explore the outside world after having lived, living locked in a tower for 18 years. So what's going on here? What's the difference? Both Mulan and Rapunzel run away from home. And on the surface, this behavior is the same, but the functions of the behavior are very different. When function of behavior is identified, we can then see that for Mulan and Rapunzel, two very different approaches are needed to support them. These scenarios highlight the importance of functional thinking. We don't match intervention or support to what the behavior looks like. Rather, we design support strategies that are matched to behavioral function. There we go. 
So how can we in integrate these principles into the FBA process? The first is that we need to make really good use um, actually, I'll talk about that in a minute. We may be able to integrate some screening questions into our open-ended indirect assessment. So our indirect assessment, keep in mind, is any method that we use to gather information about the person um, without direct observation. So this could take the form of checklists, interviews, um, looking at records, talking to the client, talking to people who know the client well. So through those types of conversations and the information that we gather indirectly, we can start to look for clues. We can start to look for clues that come out that tell us, oh, I can see that this person um, lived for several years in foster care, or I can see that this person had a, a parent that was um, in, incarcerated or struggling with addiction. I can see that this person experienced um, housing insecurity as a child. We don't need to ask all of those questions directly, but rather we can look for clues as part of the indirect assessment portion of our functional behavior assessment. I think we have to make really good use of the record review. And I know sometimes it's hard to get all of the relevant records that are gonna help us get to know a new client when they come on board. But in a lot of cases, we are gonna get some information. We might get some reports from other professionals or reports from um, medical professionals. We might get some historical information. So when we're reading through records, again, we wanna think about, are we seeing clues? that perhaps some of the things this person has experienced are traumatic. It could be things like a traumatic um, medical emergency where they were hospitalized and underwent um, a lot of invasive medical procedures. It could have been an accident or something like that. So again, we're just looking for clues. And if we see one thing like, for example, when the client was eight years old, they broke their arm and they had to go to the emergency room, Maybe that's not as big of a flag, but if we see that they had multiple stays in different foster homes and they um, experienced su substantial um, neglect as a, as a young child, we have clusters of risk. So that leads us to think that, yeah, we need to probably think a little bit more about that person's trauma history. The next thing that we can do is simply understand that each person's response to trauma is different. So we don't assume that a behavior is or is not a response to trauma, but that a traumatic event could have some influence over the behavior that we're seeing here today. But again, we really want to, in our functional um, behavior assessment, we really want to pinpoint what is the behavior here? What is the behavior of concern? Why is it a concern? How might be, it be um, jeopardizing the person's safety and well being or the safety of others? Um, and is this behavior really our priority? And finally, we want to keep in mind that sometimes challenging behavior is, in fact, a very adaptive response to a very maladaptive environment. So a big component of our functional behavior assessment should be an environmental assessment. And I actually don't think we have really good tools to do really robust environmental assessments. That could be a great PhD project. Um, but I think we need to really carefully look at the environment around the person as part of our FBA and look at environmental interventions that could really help the person um, by creating um, a safer, um, more enriched environment around them. One thing I think that can be really helpful to think about during the FBA process is this idea of identifying somebody's window of tolerance. So we're not only looking at what is challenging for the person, but also when are they at their best? When are they happy, relaxed, and engaged? And we might call that, that um, context in which we see happy, relaxed, and engaged as the person's window of tolerance. So if we start there, 
by identifying when they're at their best and what, um, what a good life looks like, then we can start to see what happens if, or how do you know when they're getting distressed? Or what does it look like when they start to become hyper aroused? What does that look like for them? And what are the types of things that trigger that sort of response? But we also might look at what are the types of things that are associated with hypoarousal? Are there things that cause them to um, disengage, shut down, freeze, run away, or withdraw? What are the things that they avoid? How can we understand some of those? Because that's really, really helpful information for us to get a more holistic picture of what's challenging for this person. And are there times where they're just so overwhelmed that we may see disassociation? They just shut down completely. So can we use our FBA in more of a strengths-based way to identify what happy, relaxed, engaged looks like and when they're at their best? And what does that look like? But also what are the things that might be associated with both hyper and hypo arousal? So let's talk a little bit more about integrating the principles into the design of our behavior support strategies. Come on, slide. We're a little sticky on the slide. While we're looking to that, I'll give you, uh, I'll, I'll tell you like the big, the big reveal. It's about building protective factors around the person. So sometimes in our role as behavior support practitioners, it's not even about designing an individualized intervention to address the challenging behavior. Yes, it's about building protective factors around the person. And so research actually tells us a number of different important protective factors. What is important or what is unique about protective factors are that there are things that are associated with resilience. And we might define resilience as the opposite of toxic stress. Resilience are the things that can help people cope in the face of adversity so that they don't experience post-traumatic stress. So for kids, some of these protective factors include things like just access to information for parents, um, about child development, child development and healthy parenting, a sense of belonging to home, family, and community, strong peer groups and networks, positive parental expectations and a home learning environment, an enriched environment where kids have lots of opportunities to learn, access to child-focused and adult-focused health services. Can they get in to see a doctor? Do they have um, health care? Um, do they have access to early intervention or family mental health services? Um, do they have access to high quality and inclusive schools and preschools? And are they um, connected to their neighborhood? So again, this is about connection. This is about building a wide network of support around the person and making sure that they're connected, in some cases, not to behavior support services, but to other social services like housing services, employment services. Sometimes you as the PBS practitioner, you're gonna be the connector, not the supporter, not the one who is delivering intervention. For adults, there's a number of protective factors that include access to employment, access to housing, family and community relationships, access to healthcare, access to social services, and effective stress management. So as a behavior support practitioner, we might be able to work with them on stress management. What are some new ways to communicate when you're upset? What are some new ways to reach out and get support when you're having a hard time? But do we as the PBS practitioner need to be the big, great connector? and help get them into social services, help get them connected with housing support, food, um, you know, food support, um, access to employment. And these are really big, big things that can make a difference. Again, we talked about resilience, but what we're trying to do here through this process of connecting is build resilience. We don't wanna be the only person that they rely on. 
we want them to have a wide network of people and supports that they can rely on because we don't know if we're going to be able to stick around forever. And think about staffing in positive behavior support. We're working with a lot of really transient staff. It's hard to get staff to stick around for the long term. And so we don't want to rely on that as their only support net because that's not probably gonna stick around for the long term. So how can we promote safety? Safety is our first principle of trauma-informed practice. We need to look at the environment first and we need to identify if the person that we're supporting is in fact living in an environment of concern. Now an environment of concern is one where the person does not have their basic wants and needs met these are things like um, having their, their needs for shelter, food, sleep, warmth. These things are not being met. These are environments that are devoid of learning opportunities, are devoid of meaningful relationships and opportunities for socialization, are devoid of opportunities for recreation and leisure, as we in America say, are devoid of opportunities to make choices, impose restrictions, and all sorts of positive behavior goes unrecognized and unreinforced. Think about clients that you've supported. Can you think of anyone who perhaps was living in an environment of concern? We need to address this first. And we can do this through creating more enriched, healthy environments around people. But there are some other things that we can do. So we can also work to establish trustworthiness and transparency as part of the process. One way that we can do this is helping the person build secure attachments. So people who have experienced certain types of trauma, particularly people who have had um, experienced abuse, neglect, removal from the home, living in foster care, out of home care, um, people who have been con constantly kicked out of school, they view other people as unpredictable. They don't feel that other people are going to do what they say and say what they do and be consistent and dependable sources of support. So the very best that thing that we can do is help people who have been impacted by trauma, particularly some of those ACEs around um, abuse, neglect, those types of things, is form strong attachments with other people. And we can do this just through spending time together, identifying what the person enjoys, and don't go in there and try to teach them a whole bunch of new skills. Go in there and just try to get to know them and just spend time together doing things that they enjoy first. Become a person who is trustworthy before you start to become the person that's going to start to change their world and teach new skills. Because um, those things are sometimes associated with different types of demands. So, um, looking at ways to build relationships both with um, staff or paid supports, but also again with informal supports, reconnecting them with family members, reconnecting them with friends and, and people within their local community. Again, this leads into the third principle, which is building a peer support network around the person. Um, we can do this through looking at, oops, developing a circle of friends. Right. And there's some really great resources. I think we'll get the PDF of the slides and you can click on some of these links. But there's some really great resources that talk about how to work with a person with disability to build a circle of friends or an, um, a, a peer or informal support network. And that can include your immediate inner circle, family, best friends, really, really close people. Um, but then it can extend outwards and include other friends that you don't see as often. Um, the circle of participation includes things like going to church, going to the local sport club, um, doing fun activities within your community. Um, and then you have the circle of exchange, which gets into more of your paid supports, like being able to go see your doctor, having a regular relationship with a health practitioner, um, having a regular relationship with your psychologist that you see um, on an ongoing basis. So so we want to think about ways to um, build this support network really thoughtfully around the person as part of the work that we do. Next is the principle of 
collaboration and mutuality. So working in partnership with people to design supports. And this is where person-centered planning can be really, really helpful. Again, there's a link here to a website that provides a whole lot of resources around person-centered planning. One model that I really like is called MAPS. Um, and essentially what it allows you to do is to get all the important people, including the person, to the degree that they're able to participate around the table and to identify what a good life looks like. What is it that you want? What is it that you want um, to be doing more of? You might not be doing all of it right now. You might not be experiencing so much of a good life right now, but let's talk about what that could look like. And then we work backwards. We work backwards to identify who's on the team that can support you to move towards experiencing that good life that you want. What's the nightmare? What would be the worst case outcome? Because we sure want to make sure we don't send you down that pathway. <laughs> what are the potential barriers that you're currently experiencing to doing more of the things that you want to do? And once we identify things like what are the barriers we need to address, who's on the team, we can start to write some short and medium term goals, right? So what is our action plan? What are the next steps that we can take to help you work towards that good life? And we can divide up the responsibilities amongst everyone on the team. First of all, we can get input from everyone on the team. So this is a really shared vision and a shared action plan. But then we can divide up the responsibilities. So it's not the PBS practitioner who does everything. The PBS practitioner plays a role, but they have all these other people who have clear responsibilities and accountabilities as well. And those people have contributed to the design of this plan. So there is more likely to be buy-in and a sense of shared accountability. The next is incorporating empowerment, choice, and voice into the process. I think there's a whole lot more that we can be doing to learn about and use the principles of supported decision-making in the work that we do. So again, there's some great resources from this organization, which I can't read on the slide, but it's on there. Um, this is some resources that help think about how do we make decisions? Because some of the people we support, they have guardianship in place. They have people who make decisions on their behalf because of their disability. And that might be appropriate. But I think sometimes we default to guardianship or other people making decisions for someone rather than building that person's own capacity to make their own decisions. And this is something the NDIS is really working towards is um, this idea of helping people make more um, supported, doesn't have to be independent, but supported decisions. So thinking about all of the factors, um, how is that decision moving the person closer to what a good life looks like for them? How is that decision reflecting the will and preference of the person that we're supporting? How is this decision going to be perceived by the person now or later in life? Um, so there's some great resources here that you can use to, um, to have those conversations and to think about what does, um, supported decision-making really looks like. And finally, we want to be culturally responsive. Now, this isn't necessarily how we deliver supports or what the support looks like. This is more how we think as practitioners. Um, a culturally effective organization or a culturally responsive organization is one that recognizes the value of diversity and the value of different cultural norms and traditions. It takes steps to ensure that all staff within the organization show a positive approach to diversity and a positive approach to different cultures. And we take steps to recognize our own biases based on our own unique learning experiences and how we can minimize the likelihood of our own biases clouding our judgment when supporting somebody who's from a different cultural background. So it doesn't mean that we have to be an expert in every other culture in the world. It just means that we have to recognize the impact of our own culture on how we view the world and, and think about whether that's impacting our judgment when we're um, developing supports for someone from a different culture.
Now, I won't have time to get into um, too many potentially contraindicated strategies, but when we talk about potentially contraindicated strategies, we're talking about things that could inadvertently intention, you might be have the best of intentions with how you're designing supports, but you're inadvertently re-traumatizing a person. So an example could be, you're working with a client who has experienced food insecurity and you propose using edible reinforcement or withholding of food and contingent delivery of food on new behaviors. While this could effectively teach new skills and change a behavior, this person already has a really disrupted relationship with food. And now you're coming in in a position of power and controlling food. That's unlikely to help the person build a healthier relationship with food, and it could run the risk of re-traumatizing the person. So a better alternative would be to help the person um, make their own choices about when they want food, what types of food that they want, to help the person understand that food is predictable and something within their control, build a healthier relationship with food, and don't use food contingently. Don't use your power in the relationship to withhold Old and contingently deliver food on behavior. So these are just some of the things we have to think about. Um, when you look through the PowerPoint, you'll see examples of other potentially contraindicated strategies. Another one here is um, for someone with a history of sexual abuse or who makes allegations, having that person in a one-to-one -one staffing ratio. That's potentially re-traumatizing the person because they're alone with an unfamiliar adult, or it's potentially putting your staff at risk. Got to be smart about these things and think about how can we put um, an appropriate and safe level of staffing in place um, that isn't going to re-traumatize the person. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just finish up by talking about a tiered approach to trauma-informed practice. So again, we want to think about infusing these principles into how our organization operates, not selecting to use them with specific clients some of the time. So it could be about um, providing staff training throughout your organization on the principles of trauma-informed practice, helping your staff learn to uh, realize the widespread impact of um, adverse experiences and recognize when trauma might be influencing someone's behavior. Um, it could be about designing policies and procedures that talk about um, how you um, think about trauma and think about potentially traumatic experiences that your clients may have um, uh, encountered as part of the work that you do. Um, making sure to provide layers of supervision for staff um, so that they can get support when designing trauma-informed behavior support plans, um, identifying when somebody might be having an adverse reaction to a program that you've put in place and, and get in and problem solve and, and make sure that um, what we're doing isn't potentially re-traumatizing the person. So there's just a couple of references that I like at the end of the presentation. And we don't have time for questions, but we will come back together at, after lunch for a panel discussion. So thank you everyone for listening. Hopefully that was informative. <laughs> thank you. And I also just wanna recognize all of the collective wisdom in the room and online, and that I'm sure you guys have amazing knowledge as well. And I don't claim to be the expert. I just claim to be trying to increase awareness. So please, please get out there and tell your stories as well. Thank you very much, Sharon. I think everybody would agree. Um, thank you to our participants online. We had up to 230 people online this morning. And the commentary has been really positive as well okay. through in the chat. We do have questions from Zoom, uh, but we'll take those on notice. And um, for those who are remaining with us today that um, have been able to attend in person, um, feel free to join us for a late lunch and we'll have a, a fairly informal Q&A session afterwards and you can ask all your questions. So we'll um, again thank Erin um, for thank her input. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Thanks everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and to our Zoom participants who are asking, yes, the slides will be distributed. Uh, you will get a certificate of attendance for professional development. 
um, and we will um, check the recording um, and hopefully it went okay. And if the recording is up to standard, um, it'll be edited and, and distributed as well, which um, everybody's asking about. So thank you. And um, for those staying, um, join us for light lunch. And thank you to everybody and cheerio. Thank you. Cheerio. Bye. Bye. No, gonna end the Zoom. Oh, you wanna end it? Yeah, we were we were wondering what you wanted to do. Yeah. We're just gonna start on one. Thanks. Is there any way I can pull my power screen up on the screen just so I can take a picture of it?